Well, welcome back. If you if you have a Bible, I ask you to turn to Acts chapter three, uh, verses uh, one through to uh, twenty six. It's the story of the healing of the of the lame man, and we're going to I'm going to read this passage uh, to you now. Acts chapter three, and we are beginning at verse one. One day, Peter and John were were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, He asked them for money and Peter looked straight at him as did John and then Peter said look at us. So the man gave them his full attention expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said silver or gold I do not have but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness that we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you, Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. 
ending at verse 26. And we thank God that his word always speaks to us today. We're thinking this morning of our God who heals. And we know that that Matthew 9 and 35 tells us that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And so this verse, amongst many others in the Gospels, helps us to understand the ministry of Jesus as being a threefold ministry of teaching, of preaching or proclaiming and healing. And I think for many in today's church, we are, we are that bit more comfortable with the teaching and preaching aspect of ministry, but we're not sure or as sure about a healing ministry. When John the Baptist was in prison, he sent some of his followers to inquire of Jesus whether he was the promised Messiah or indeed someone else. And Jesus' Jesus' response to John's question was to say, well, you go and tell John what you hear and see, that the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. Matthew 11, 4 and 5. Three years later, as his earthly ministry was drawing to a close, We know that Jesus met with his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. And he said to them, In solemn truth I tell you that anyone believing in me shall do the same miracles that I have done, and even greater ones, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask him anything using my name and I will do it, for this will bring praise to the Father because of what I, the Son, will do for you. Again, John 14, 12 to 13. I wonder how do you react to that verse? For what Jesus is saying is that when my church is established as it would be after Pentecost, all who believe in me shall do the very same miracles that I have done, but even greater ones. That ministry within the life of my church will continue Preaching, teaching and healing, all in the name of Jesus. But what about the church of today? I wonder, do you believe that that miracles can happen today? Do you believe that God still heals today? And if your answer is yes, do you then have a longing that God will move in greater power by his spirit to equip us in this threefold ministry of preaching, teaching and healing? The story of the healing of the lame beggar in Acts 3 was the first of many examples of the miraculous at work in the life of the early church. It provides evidence of the continuation of the healing ministry of Jesus in the power of the Spirit after he ascended into heaven. And what we see in Acts chapter 3 is the church beginning to move out into the world with healing power, reminding us of what a spirit-filled church is able to do as long as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. The setting for this healing miracle was that day when Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was three in the afternoon. We know that from verse 1. And there was a huge throng of people that day, as usual, making their way to the temple in Jerusalem for this designated 3 o'clock in the afternoon prayer time that always happened according to Jewish practice. And there at the beautiful gate, which marked the entrance to the temple precincts, lay this man who had been lame from birth, This man who was carried there by his friends every day to this location in order to beg from those going in to pray. But for him, today was going to be different. As it can be for any of us when we encounter with God. When the man sees Peter and John about to enter the temple precincts, he does what he has 
done for years with all the passers-by. He, he asks them to have pity on him. In other words, what he was really saying, can I have some money? Sadly, this is also an all too common sight today in our towns and cities up and down our land. But this man got far more than he bargained for that day. The fact that, that Peter says that they have no money is likely to be the consequence of what we know from chapter 2 about how these new believers had begun to share their property possessions with all amongst them who, who were in need. And so material possessions, and including money, was, well, it was no longer a, a priority for most of them. For Peter and John, along with the other disciples of Jesus, they had found a new power, a new kind of living that had taken their encounter with God onto a new level. And so Peter doesn't even ask the man whether he wanted to be healed or not. For Peter, uh, healing this man at that moment uh, seemed to be the most natural thing to do. And he wasn't interested in giving him just money. He, he knew that the man needed to be healed. And so he went ahead and he heals him in the name of Jesus. It's interesting that Luke emphasises that Peter and John looked hard at the man. I wonder what they were looking for as they stared at him. Uh, were they trying to discern in that moment whether this man had a sincere spirit? D did he deep down really want to be free of his dis disability? Perhaps they saw a heart that was full of pain and sorrow because of the hard life that he had lived up to this moment. But someone who was ready to be touched by God's healing love. And so Peter doesn't just say, stand up and walk, which is the way that Jesus himself may have done. He wanted to make it quite clear where the power to heal resides. Peter makes it very clear where the healing power that was about to be unleashed resides, that it is in the name of the Messiah Jesus. The name of Jesus that counts here. And Luke is anxious uh, to give total impact to what happens next. So taking him by the right hand, he, he helped him up and instantly we're told that the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, uh, this time walking and jumping and, and praising God. Peter had pronounced healing in the name of Jesus. And his healing is instantaneous. Muscles, ligaments and ankle joints come together. What had not been in place suddenly was now in place. Where there had been nothing but weakness, there was now strength. Ankles and legs were strong enough to support him with the help of enabling him to get onto his feet and not only to walk, as I've said for the first time, but to be able to jump and to leap about. I don't know about you, but I'm just trying to, to imagine this scene and, and to feel his, his utter joy. Remembering that Jesus was no longer physically present, he had ascended into heaven from whence he came. But what we're seeing now is that his disciples were, were now filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of Jesus, they were able to heal this man instantaneously. What an incredible and yet beautiful and moving scene this must have been. Tom Wright, in his commentary on Acts, uh, makes an interesting point. He says that up until this incident, the whole story had taken place in Jerusalem, but not in and around the temple. Now we're finding that the followers of Jesus had the courage to regularly go to worship in the temple, even though we know that their fellowship and their bread breaking and their prayer uh, happened elsewhere, quite often in their homes. But the power of bringing healing in the name of Jesus took place not in the temple, but actually outside the gate of the entrance into the temple. And this is significant because it says 
that, that God is on the move. He's not confined to working within the Jewish institution, but that God is seeking to, to break out into the world so that the ministry of Jesus, his, of preaching, teaching and healing would be available for all and to anyone or everyone who needs it. The reaction of those who, who witnessed this healing was uh, to be filled with a mixture of wonder, amazement and even an astonishment. They were not quite believing, is this the man who, is, who had been carried to this gate for years by his friends, unable to walk? Uh, and yet he is able to walk and we've seen it right before our very eyes. You can imagine how people were, were talking with each other. Did you see that? Oh, hi, what happened there? What, what was going on? How were they able to do that? I wonder, have you ever watched the repair shop on BBC on Wednesday nights? It's a programme where, where people bring items in that have fallen into disrepair uh, to a series of expert fixers who take the item and seek to make it like new and return it to the owners. One such item was one week an old pedal harmonium that had not worked for many decades. And it was amazing to watch in the programme how the expert lovingly stripped the harmonium down part by part and then slowly but surely he put the parts together again, uh, also some with new parts that were beyond salvaging. And tears were shed when the owner came back to find his own organ unrecognisable as it was now in fully working order. Now, of course, a, a crippled man is not the same as a lifeless pedal harmonium. And the healing power at work that day had, had nothing to do with the expertise of Peter or John because they were not anyone special, as they said. They're not some expert restorer. Peter simply trusted in the only one who could bring healing to the lame man that day. That was namely Jesus himself. And so as the crowd questioned Peter and John, they said, look, it wasn't, this wasn't anything to do with us. It's all about Jesus. Which was a cue for Peter to become Peter the preacher again. For he wanted to drive home this point by when he launched into this impromptu sermon, he wanted to direct attention away from himself to his Lord Jesus, who only a few short weeks ago had preached in the very same temple precincts. They were wanting to say the power to heal is not theirs. It is by faith in the name of Jesus, this man who now you see and was made strong. The same Jesus about whom he said in the previous verses that you had handed over to be killed, who you disowned before Pilate, although Pilate had decided to let him go. That, that you are, are the people who rejected Jesus, where you cried out, we have no king but Caesar. You even preferred the terrorist Barabbas to Jesus. And yet it was by faith in the name of Jesus that this man has been healed. The church had power because it had faith in Jesus' name. Peter and John fully trusted in the name of Jesus. And of course, so must we. Would you not want to witness a miracle of healing like this? Over the years, I have witnessed uh, dramatic healings. I'm thinking of one of the late Derek Prince's meetings that I attended in Hollywood, uh, and also at a, at a Jimmy Smith concert in Dundonald Methodist Church, both nearly 40 years ago. Someone in that Dundonald meeting had been, had been paralyzed in a wheelchair. They came paralyzed. They then walked out of the building healed of the paralysis. And over the years in ministry, uh, others and I, have, you know, we've prayed for people and we've seen healing answers to our prayers that have even, as some have even astounded medical people. See, any spirit-filled church needs to have spirit-filled people who seek to impart what it has to give. Hope, blessing, and of course, healing in the name of Jesus, whose trust and confidence is only with Jesus. Our God has not changed. The Holy Spirit does not change. 
We are called today within the life of the church to continue to pray for people in the name of Jesus for healing of body, mind and spirit. And then we leave all the answers to God. Could it be that in these difficult days that God is asking his church to, to waken up, to seek his face, to ask that God, that you would come by your spirit and touch us afresh and equip us to minister to others in the all-powerful name of Jesus. Surely this is the challenge that we face this morning as we begin to, to contemplate moving out of lockdown. Let us seek God together to be ready, to be filled with the Spirit so that we can minister to a lost world and all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing song is going to be another new song for many. It is simply named Healer. It's reminding us again that we believe today in our God who heals. And so until uh, next uh, Sunday, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>